Hi, welcome back. I hope everyone is logging on again. Um, my name is Nikki Yoshihara. I will introduce myself once more, just in case. And um, I will show you around Tokyo today. I'm standing in front of the Imperial Palace right now. So you can see the building behind me. Um, in 2011, I came to Tokyo with my husband, who is Japanese. And um, after studying Japanese for two years, I decided to start my own company on the advice of a dear friend of mine. So what I do in my daily life, I organize guided tours in uh, Tokyo or in Japan, actually, so not necessarily Tokyo. So we have around uh, 30 guides in Tokyo and we have uh, about uh, 10 guides uh, in the Kansai area. So that's uh, Osaka and Kyoto. Um, anyway, I'm going to take you on a trip through Tokyo and uh, let me know how you, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, there might be a slight time delay before I can see your questions. So um, don't worry if I don't answer immediately. Um, well, again, a warm welcome and let's start with our tour. Ooh. Sorry about that. I hope it's okay. Okay. So this is part of the Imperial Palace. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the history of Japan first. So Japan has always been ruled by an emperor and uh, in 1193 the emperor was deposed because before then there were all these warring states run by daimyos so that were like little fiefdoms or kingdoms within Tokyo and finally in uh, 1193 there was a the first shogun came into power and he united all the daimyos under his rule and he said that they from then on had to obey him and not listen to the emperor anymore uh, okay rotate the image yeah i am filming in portrait mode Oh, I have to, okay, let's change it. Is this better? I hope you can all see what I'm filming now. Anyway, so as I was saying, um, the first Shogun that ever was in Japan was uh, the um, uh, Minamoto Yorimoto. So he united Japan and um, he founded the first, uh, he founded the first uh, uh, capital of Japan outside of Kyoto because before that the um, uh, emperor had always been in Kyoto and obviously he had to change the capital from Kyoto to somewhere else because uh, uh, he didn't want to be associated with the um, emperor. Oh, the light is still green. I'm just going to run and see if I can make it. Yay, we made it. Okay, so he founded the first capital in Kamakura and um, Tokugawa Ieyasu, he was the shogun who founded Edo. And uh, now obviously it's called Tokyo, but back then he called the capital of Japan Edo. Um, let me show you the Imperial Palace again. So, you can't see it too well because a lot of it is hidden by trees. So this side is Maranochi. And over here, in the distance, you can see Tokyo Station. 
So we'll go there later on. This is actually a very popular uh, spot for taking wedding pictures. So maybe we'll catch someone doing wedding pictures later on, hopefully. Okay. I'll just take you to a little park that's across the street from the Imperial Palace. Because of the coronavirus, still a lot of public places are closed right now. So it's uh, quite difficult for Japanese people to go out and relax themselves because most of them live in really small apartments. But fortunately, this park never closed. So you will see a lot of people here relaxing and having a little picnic. It's already 5 p.m. here right now. So obviously the number of people is less than what it is if you're here at noon or something. Also, uh, these streets around the Imperial Palace, if you go around the palace, it's exactly five kilometers. So maybe you can see in the distance, there's some people running. So a lot of people use these streets to run 5k or 10k. So you'll see lots of people jogging around here. So these streets with the cars, it's closed off on the weekends uh, until around 2 p.m. So you can ride your bike in the middle of the street or walk around or whatever you want to do. Normally they even have a bike rental place where, uh, hi Kathy, thank you for the question. It's uh, around 5 p.m. right now in Tokyo. Um, as I was saying, there's a bike rental place so you can rent a tandem bike or a regular bike. In the distance, you can see uh, Nishishinbashi, um, the tall building that sticks out in the back. That's where the um, uh, buses depart to go to the Olympic Village. So if you're here for the Olympics, you can catch the bus over there and uh, go to the sport grounds. Okay, and over here in the background, you can see Akasaka and Kasumi Kaseki. Kasumi Kaseki is famous for um, government buildings. So uh, most of the government buildings are located in Kasumi Kaseki. So now I'll show you a little bit of the park. Some people picnicking here. So this is definitely a area where you're not allowed to bike. Here you see Marunochi again in the background. So you can see some people relaxing in the background. So hopefully more public places will open soon because Tokyo is officially out of lockdown. Here are also some of the nice pine trees. There's a lot of those around this area. And uh, there are special gardeners that take care of them. So what they do is they take a ladder and go to each individual tree and they will groom them all one by one by hand. So as you can imagine, it's a lot of work taking care of all these trees. So welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're here. This is my first live event. So let me know if you like it. Maybe I can do some more live events in Tokyo and show you some different areas. So let me tell you a bit more about the Imperial Palace. So when the Shogun first came to the Edo area, he started, uh, or he built the, um, uh, built a castle actually. So if you go inside the um, East Gardens, 
you can see the foundations of the original building where the shogun used to live. Unfortunately, it was uh, a wooden structure, so that's all that you can see. That's all that remains. But still, it's quite impressive, I feel. And maybe you can see in the distance the wall that goes around the Imperial Palace. Before, the grounds of the Imperial Palace were a lot bigger than they are today. So around this area, this also all belonged to the Imperial Palace. You can see another wall in a minute. So the whole area was huge. And later on, we're going to see Maranochi. And um, in Maranochi, that's where a lot of the daimyos, uh, the landlords used to live. So the landlords were responsible for collecting taxes and to pay tribute to the uh, shogun. So the shogun was actually quite smart because uh, before the shogun came into power, all of the daimyos were always fighting with each other. And uh, so the shogun said, all of the daimyos need to have a residence in Tokyo or in Edo, and they have to come to Edo once a year and pay tribute and have to bring all their samurais and all their people and the wives of the shogun had to, uh, oh, sorry, the wives of the daimyos had to uh, actually live in Edo and the daimyos themselves had to live there for part of the year. But these trips from their uh, hometown all the way to Edo were so awfully expensive that they didn't have any cash left to pay their uh, samurai to wage war. So when the shogun came into power, that was finally when there was no more war and uh, Japan was able to focus on um, art and personal development. So that's when all the fighting stopped and that's when all of the beautiful calligraphy started and poetry and all of the uh, other Japanese art forms. Okay, we're walking towards Marunochi now. So here you can see part of the wall. This is where we came from, from the Imperial Palace. So this is the moat. This, this moat goes all the way around the Imperial Palace and was meant to keep intruders at bay. And in the background, you see the buildings of uh, Marunochi. So, uh, Marunochi literally means uh, inside the circle. Here you can see Tokyo T Station in the distance. Uh, the shogun, the first shogun came to power in 1193, uh, uh, Tarik. But actually the most important, sh one of the most important shoguns was uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu. He came into power in 1603 and he was responsible for founding Edo. Okay, we're going to cross the street. I think I need to hurry if I want to make it. Okay. So over there you'll see the Palace Hotel. The top floor has a lovely view on the Imperial Palace. So definitely worth it to go there and uh, have lunch or have a drink. Okay, so we're close to Tokyo Station now. You can see Tokyo Station in the background. Oh, by the way, if you want to visit the Imperial Palace, only the East Gardens are open. So the, the East Gardens are free of admission and you can just go there during opening hours. But the palace itself is only open on January 2nd and February 23rd. 
There's also special free tours that you can do inside the Imperial Palace, but it's a very limited area that you can see. And first they'll put you in front of a TV screen and let you watch uh, some kind of video for an hour or so and then let you walk around for 20 minutes. So personally, I would say it's not really worth it, but uh, depends on how much of a fan you are of the Imperial Palace. So recently, the last April, there was a new emperor. So uh, Naruhito uh, came to the throne. Uh, his father abdicated because his uh, um, health wasn't too great. Okay, let's show you a bit more. So his wife is uh, Masako. So before Naruhito came to the throne, he actually lived in uh, Asakusa. And in Asakusa, there's another palace, but that's more Western style. So it's completely different design than the Imperial Palace. So now we're going to walk around Maranochi for a little bit. What I like so much about Tokyo is that every area has its own atmosphere and uh, it's completely different wherever you go. So this has a completely different vibe from where we were earlier around the Imperial Palace. And if you look closely, uh, pretty much every area has uh, their own uh, wardrobe as well, so to speak. So people generally look differently and dress differently. So obviously most of you probably know Harajuku and the Harajuku fashion. Uh, that's quite well known, but the uh, Omotosando area that's near to Harajuku also has their own fashion. So that's where a lot of the flagships are, but mostly for the um, younger shops, so for younger people. So Ginza is another shopping area that's well known throughout Japan. But Ginza is more for a bit older generation, so maybe 40 to 60 year old people. Also, if you want to see people walk around in kimono, then uh, Ginza is your best bet because that's where all the old ladies like to hang out and they tend to wear kimono more often than uh, uh, the young people. So this street is famous for its street art. So there's lots of installations and they change them occasionally. So this one is actually quite nice, I think. So we're just gonna walk around here for a bit and then we'll head over to Tokyo Station. So here's also lots of shops. Um, so this area, the Marinochi area where we're walking right now, this used to be a swamp. So it was drained in 1590. Before 1590, this was like an inlet to Tokyo Bay. So this all was swamp and water and it didn't get changed until then because obviously the the shogun needed the ground to build the imperial uh, castle um, in 1592 so two years after this area was drained the castle was first built so here's uh, some more street art and I quite like this as well. These nice red pumps. So let me tell you a little bit about the current situation in Tokyo. So we've been in lockdown since um, 
April 1st approximately. So in March, March 1st, all the schools closed, but Tokyo has had a soft lockdown. Uh, that's because apparently there was something in the constitution where they cannot force people to stay inside and have a lockdown. So Asahi Shimbun, that's like one of the major newspapers in uh, Tokyo, um, actually did a survey and discovered that 60% uh, uh, of their readers that did the survey were still going to work every day, even though we were in lockdown mode. Uh, still, the schools were closed. And since last Monday, the lockdown has officially been lifted. So as you can see, some shops have opened up, but still there, a lot of it is still closed. So unfortunately, uh, the East gardens are still closed and many of the other gardens around Tokyo are closed as well. Okay, we're walking up towards uh, uh, Tokyo Station now. So this area in Marunochi was called Daimyo Koji. Uh, Daimyo Koji means uh, Daimyo Alley. And the reason for that is uh, because there were so many Daimyos that were living here. And unfortunately, all of the uh, original buildings have been destroyed. Uh, this area got bombed quite heavily during World War II. The Tokyo Station used to be uh, much higher and would have gorgeous glass domes, but unfortunately that all got destroyed and uh, there wasn't enough funds available to uh, make it the same as the original. So they decided to change the roof structure and just making it a bit more simple. Uh, some construction workers. As you can see, there's still lots of people wearing masks. Uh, I've been asked before and it's not mandatory to wear a mask, but still most people do it anyway. So that's actually quite good, I think. So uh, the Shogun has been in power until um, 1868. That's when the Meiji Restoration started. And um, there were actually several influences that caused the Shogun to lose its power to the emperor. So before the um, Shogun lost his power to the emperor, the um, uh, Kubla Khan, the great warlord from Mongolia came to Japan twice. So it depleted the Shogun's funds quite a bit to fight off the uh, Mongolian army. And then uh, the Americans came to Japan and they tried to force the Shogun to open the country because before that time only Dutch traders were allowed to come to Japan. They had their own special island called Deshima and uh, the Dutch could only go and stay in Deshima. Uh, there was a bridge that uh, connected Deshima to the mainland and uh, obviously there were guards there and that's the only place that they could go. Um, but uh, the reason why the Dutch were the only people allowed to trade with Japan is because they didn't force their religion on uh, the Japanese. Because before that, the Portuguese came to Japan, but they tried to make everyone uh, convert them into Christians. And the uh, Shogun wasn't too happy about that. So he was like, um, okay, we need to get rid of all these Portuguese. So he drove all of the Christians to a little peninsula and then he basically killed every man, woman and child on the peninsula and tried to eradicate Christianity completely. And then he wanted to go back to the old values 
and uh, he tried to get rid of Buddhism as well. But some of the priests were actually quite smart and they said uh, whenever one of the uh, people from the shogun came over, they said, oh, no, 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 this is, uh, this is not a Buddhist temple. Uh, so you don't have to destroy this or you don't have to close this. Uh, uh, we adhere to the traditional Japanese uh, religion and uh, there's no problem. We don't believe in uh, all these Buddhist gods. So fortunately, some of the temples were still preserved. Okay, so right now we are in front of Tokyo Station. So straight ahead of me, you see the uh, Tokyo Station Hotel. So this is quite a lovely hotel. Oh, by the way, uh, I don't know if many people know this, but um, there's this rumor that goes around that Tokyo Station was modeled after uh, Amsterdam Central Station, but that's actually not true. There are some comparisons, especially the bricks, the uh, orange bricks with the white accents. You see that in uh, Amsterdam Central Station as well, but uh, yeah, he didn't uh, copy it or anything. It's his own style. Um, so the Tokyo Station was opened in 1914 and uh, Tatsuno Kingo uh, was its architect. This is actually the busiest station in Japan and 4,000 trains daily depart from this station. And fa around 500,000 people on average use Tokyo Station every day to get to home or even take the bullet train to go to different parts of Japan. Okay, let me show you the other side. So this is where we came from. In the distance is the Imperial Palace. And here you see some more buildings of the Marnochi area. So Mar the Marunouchi area is actually the financial heart of Tokyo. And um, here is where most of the financial institutions are located uh, and a lot of the banks. So this area is responsible for 25% of the Japanese GDP. And um, uh, Yonosuku, uh, Mitsubishi bought Marunouchi uh, in 1890 and he paid 1.5 million yen for this whole area. So 1.5 million yen is uh, about uh, 30,000 euros or about 50,000 US dollars. So in today's money, that would be crazy if you could buy this area for that price. Obviously, it's much more expensive now. Actually, in this station, uh, there were two assassination attempts on the Prime Minister of uh, Japan. So in 1921, uh, Hara Takashi was stabbed to death. And in 1930, Osachi Hamaguchi was shot. And he survived at first, but then uh, he died like a year later because of his injuries. So now we're walking towards the countdown for the Olympic ceremony. So as you can see, they changed the date and time. So still 419 days to go. So obviously before um, the originally the Olympics were planned for um, this summer, but because of the whole Corona situation, they had to cancel it. So here you can see how many days and how many hours and how many minutes. So the Olympics are now scheduled for July 23rd until August 8th, 2021. The last time the Olympics were held in Tokyo was uh, it, um, 1968, uh, 64, sorry. 
and uh, the Olympic Commission has uh, uh, the goal of the Olympic Commission is to be the to host the most innovative Olympic Games in the world. Okay, we're just gonna go through Tokyo Station now. And the way uh, they want to achieve that is by using robots for practically everything. So what they have is uh, lots of different kind of robot assistants. So they have wheelchair assistants that will help with people who um, uh, need help getting around. Um, they've designed special exoskeletons. It's kind of like a robot suit that people can wear and that will help them to lift heavy things. This is actually a technique that is uh, being implemented in the countryside as well because um, a lot of the farmers are actually um, quite old. So uh, a lot of them are like 60 years or older or sometimes 80 or 90 years old. So they're using the exoskeletons uh, so they can still work. Okay, right now we're in the Tokyo station, the Marunouchi side. I will try to show you the ceiling because it's quite nice. So this is one of the few domes that have been preserved. There were a couple of glass domes as well originally, but unfortunately they were destroyed during the World War. Recently they actually uh, did some renovations, so they're finally finished now, so everything almost looks like it's supposed to be. Okay, so here is the entrance to the station. So this left sign, you can see where all the bullet trains uh, depart from. So these are the ticket gates that you can go through. And right here you can uh, purchase your tickets. So if you haven't got a bullet train ticket or a train ticket, you can come here to these vending machines. Here you can also see a map of the just a rail system in uh, Tokyo. So this doesn't have the sun. So it's quite complicated. So that's why we always advise people to use a guide, at least for the first day, because uh, otherwise it's quite difficult to get around and you will lose a lot of time by taking the train in the wrong direction. Okay, right now it's probably going to be a little bit boring, but we're going to walk underneath the station and we're going to walk towards the Yaesu side. So it's still a lot quieter than it would normally be around Tokyo Station. Dutch merchant, that was quite popular. So in Tokyo Station there are a lot of lockers. So for a couple, I'll try to get out of the station for, I'll try to get out of the station as quickly as possible. Okay, so underneath the station, there's lots of shops and restaurants. So if you have to wait for your train, then uh, I would definitely advise you to get something to eat. Okay, I can go up here. So, yeah. I hope you guys can still hear me. I'm nearly out of the station. So here are some more lockers. These are really convenient if you want to store your uh, luggage for a bit. So there's two major uh, airports in Tokyo. There's the Narita airport and there's the... Um, uh, I can't get a, on the name of the other one right now, but I'll tell you later. But in any case, um, so it's very easy to take the train from the Narita airport to uh, Tokyo Station. 
so if you want to walk around a bit i would definitely advise you to store your lock uh get a locker and store your luggage here in the tokyo station and um, walk around a bit so we're out of the station right now and we're walking towards uh Yurakcho area there's some uh, really nice department stores here this is uh, Daimaru. If you go to a department store in Tokyo, I can definitely recommend uh, going to the ground floor because they have lots of great food at a very affordable prices. This um, department store also has Tokyo Hands. Tokyo Hands is a great store. They sell everything. Uh, so if you want to buy some souvenirs, you should definitely uh, have a look there. So they have lots of uh, Japan inspired presents that you can buy and they have uh, cards and books and uh, other stationery so you'll definitely find something nice here so this is a cycling area actually not too many people around Tokyo use their bikes there are not really a lot of bike lanes so you either have to cycle in the road or uh, in some areas it's permitted to cycle in the street as well but obviously pedestrians don't really pay much attention to you so it's really a nightmare to cycle around tokyo with all the crazy taxi drivers that uh, don't pay attention to you and cut you off and uh, suddenly stop so basically the taxi drivers just stop on the side of the street wherever they want so if you're cycling and one might stop in front of you without any warning so that can definitely be uh, annoying okay so we're still in the Yurakcho area this area was named after uh, Oda Nagamasa he was a daimyo in the 16th century and uh, they also called him uh, Yurakus uh, Yurakusai that uh, name was changed to Yurakcho during the Meiji period so there's lots of little streets around the Yurakcho area and Yurakcho is also very famous for lots of little restaurants so basically the um, railroad uh, runs through the Yurakcho area uh, I'll show you in a bit and uh, the railroad uh, underneath the railroad there's lots of uh, small restaurants so uh, it's an area that's very uh, popular amongst um, salary men so here's another one of those little streets so if you want to have a cheap lunch or cheap dinner I would definitely advise you to go there and uh, walk around there's lots of yakitori places and izakayas that's like a Japanese style pub and it's quite affordable so for around 2,000 yen and up you should be able to get a nice dinner as you can see the Tokyo 2020 signs are still up here's another one of those little streets uh, typical street food in Tokyo uh, thank you for asking Tarek is um, they, they don't really have that much street food because you're not really allowed to eat in the street so what they do is uh, when there's a matsuri matsuri is a japanese word for festival so this is the exit of tokyo station uh, then that's usually when they have street food so uh, the matsuri are usually around um, 
uh, a temple or a shrine. And uh, if there's a festival, there's lots of little uh, markets where you can buy treats and um, uh, food. So most of the food they sell there is obviously yakitori and um, yakiniku. Ah, uh, sorry, not yakiniku. Um, fried noodles and um, what else? Yeah, they usually have bananas dipped in chocolate and strawberries dipped in sugar. So that kind of thing. And sometimes they have some games. So if you really want to eat street food, the best place to go is um, uh, Skiji. So Skiji was originally um, the uh, fish market in Tokyo, but the area was quite old. It's currency exchange. So they changed it to the Toyosa area. So that's closer towards the, here you see one of this typical Yoracho street. So that's um, uh, close to where the Olympics are being held. So there's lots of uh, police boxes everywhere around Tokyo. The yellow sign, the top of the sign you can see how many people have died yesterday uh, due to uh, road accidents. And the line below is how many accidents there have been. So Japanese people really love their stats. So there's lots of shops that are open 24 hours. So this is um, uh, like a, not a pharmacy yeah like cross between a pharmacy and a drugstore and a convenience store i would say so right now we're walking towards ginza ginza is one of those famous uh, shopping streets so pretty much everywhere you see lots of uh, uh, convenience stores i'll see if i can take you inside so you can have a look of what they have so this is a typical convenience store in Tokyo. So they have lots of uh, ready-made meals. So here, I hope you can see it. So these meals, they generally have a microwave. So you can ask for them to um, microwave the food for you. And they're really quite cheap. Like um, these pastas are only 370 yen. So that's around uh, 350, uh, sorry, $3.50, something like that. Or around two, three euros. So there's, they also have lots of healthy options. As I heard that a lot of uh, uh, convenience stores in other countries don't really have that. So they have lots of salads and they have all kinds of snacks and yogurts and Japanese drinks. These are often quite cheap and if you prefer bread, they generally have lots of bread as well. So if you're here on a budget for 500 yen, it's like a five US dollars, you can just buy something cheap. And the drinks too. So if you just buy a drink, it's a little over um, 100 yen. So that's about one US dollar. So it's like 80 euro cent. And they have alcoholic beverages too, but you need to be at least 20 years or older if you want to drink alcohol. And they have lots of um, like toothbrushes and sometimes even like dress shirts or underwear in case you are a salary man and you're stranded. You can't go take the train home. And they have lots of special health drinks. So, I'll show you. This is actually a, a special one. This is, you're supposed to drink it when you uh, go out drinking for the night. Uh, it's supposed to align your stomach so uh, you will not have a hangover the next day after you 
drink. And there's lots of cup noodles, so you can just add some hot water, take it to your hotel or whatever. And of course, lots of yummy Japanese snacks, and chocolates and the... Okay, so these are so typical Japanese snacks. They really, these are... Um, Uh, dried plums and fresh plums they're quite sour but they're supposed to be very good for your health and chewing gum and of course ice cream as well and they generally have uh, like some nice snacks hot snacks like some fried food and uh, uh, meat buns and another thing I can recommend they have amazing coffee machines. So if you need your uh, uh, caffeine shot, I can definitely recommend for you to get some coffee at a convenience store because it's so much cheaper than uh, Starbucks or one of those fancy coffee places. And the coffee is actually quite good. So I would definitely recommend uh, doing that early in the morning. So, uh, what I would recommend if your hotel doesn't have any breakfast, so just grab an onigiri, that's a rice bowl, and uh, get some coffee or some drinks. Fortunately, Tokyo also has lots and lots of vending machines. Uh, in Ginza, not so much, because this is quite a posh area. So you'll not see that many vending machines around this uh, place. But um, yeah, you don't have to bring lots and lots of drinks because uh, it's really not too bad. You can just easily uh, get something to drink. So I'll show you some of the streets. So that's the, that direction is uh, Shimbashi area. And here we're walking around Nihonbashi right now. We've left the Yuacho area and we're walking towards Ginza. It's a really nice uh, giraffe here. So I love how Tokyo has lots of street art. So we're waiting for the traffic light to turn green. Lots of tall buildings around here. So Everyone is really curious about us. Uh, lots of people looking to see what we're doing. Um, Tokyo is actually quite a big city, but uh, it depends on how you, uh, what your definition of Tokyo is, because Tokyo is also like a province or a prefecture. So the greater Tokyo area has around 26 million people but but that uh, encompasses other cities as well so not just Tokyo but also like Chiba or Yokohama or those kind of areas so only in Tokyo is around 8 million people so we're coming up towards the Ginza area now we walk a bit faster, it might be a bit boring. So I love how a lot of uh, companies have these cute mascots. So this, this is actually a bank. But this bank uh, uses these cute uh, dolls as their mascot. Basically, a lot of companies around uh, Japan have their own mascot. So if there's something going on, you often see a mascot. And also the um, prefectures often have their own mascot. Uh, I forgot the name, but there's a very famous, uh, I think its name is Kumachan or something. Uh, it's a black bear with red cheeks, so you might have seen him. Okay, here's another uh, convenience store. 
So these are open 24 seven. So it's super convenient. So there's another one. So that one across the street is Natural Lawson. So it's a little bit more fancy than the other convenience store. So it's a bit more pricey, but definitely interesting uh, to go there. So it's really quiet right now compared to normal. Normally there would be so much more traffic and people walking around. really naughty and jump the red light <laughs> since it's quiet anyway so basically Tokyo is a grid and it's divided up into different areas so maybe in the background you can see Showa Dori Avenue so these streets are super super long and cut Tokyo into different pieces okay there's lots of these uh, pedestrian bridges that uh, go over the road that's really convenient if you want to cross the street and you don't have to wait for the light ah, we are in front of another bank actually there's not many places where you can uh, get cash in Tokyo if you have a foreign ATM card so I would definitely advise you if you come to Tokyo Bring some cash and uh, uh, Japan post office you can get uh, money from the ATM and um, uh, at the convenience stores also they have ATMs that accept uh, foreign cards uh, as you can see there's lots of uh, vending machines everywhere in the streets of Tokyo so right now here you see all these blue labels that means that these are cold drinks so sometimes you see some red labels too not right now because it's getting warmer but if the labels are red that means that it's a hot drink instead of a cold drink so uh, most vending machines both have uh, hot drinks and cold drinks So as you can see, here's another place that's still closed, unfortunately. So it's kind of hit or miss. So right now, if you want to have some drinks or go to dinner in Tokyo, you never know for sure if they're open or not. Even during the lockdown, some restaurants were just open and some weren't. There's this uh, rotating sushi place near my house. And, uh, oh, I see another question from uh, Bodan. Uh, you cannot use a card in a vending machine, only uh, Suica. So there's two kinds of cards in Japan. That's Suica or Pasmo. And that's like a sort of prepaid card. So the Suica and Pasmo card you can use to um, uh, pay for public transport and you can also top it up and uh, pay at the convenience store um, but yeah credit card is also quite convenient in uh, Tokyo because a lot of the bigger shops, you can just use your credit card. But unfortunately, a lot of the small izakayas only work with uh, cash. So I would definitely make sure you always have at least uh, 10,000 yen in your wallet 
in case you're somewhere where they don't accept uh, uh, cash. Uh, sorry, cards. Okay, we're just gonna cross the street here. So, another little ramen place. So as you can see, this uh, ramen restaurant has some lanterns uh, in front of the restaurant. And uh, that actually harkens back to an uh, ancient tradition. This is a little shrine, let's show you. Lots of little shrines around the uh, Tokyo area. So, before it was some homeless people around Tokyo as well. So before, you couldn't really see on the outside whether a building was uh, like a tea house or a restaurant or whether it was meant for um, uh, like a residence for people to live in. So um, what they did was all of the restaurants and inns, the ryokans, uh, they had these red lanterns on the outside. And the red lantern signified that the building was a commercial building and not residential. And uh, uh, if the lantern was burning, that meant they were open for business. And if it wasn't burning, then obviously it meant they were closed. Uh, quite a few of the tea houses were quite exclusive. So it was a uh, appointment only and you had to be some kind of member. So uh, you could only get there if you were invited by someone. So here's another one. So this is more like the way Tokyo used to be. Lots of not too tall buildings and little streets. So I'll show you something right here. So Tokyo sells its houses as a little plot. So as you can see, there's some space in between two different buildings. And uh, basically that means that um, most streets are sold plot by plot. And uh, therefore every house looks slightly different from the next. And also here, there's a sign. This is like a address sign. So this tells you what area we're in right now, because the thing in Tokyo is that they don't start the beginning of the street with uh, number one and then end at 50 or something. No, it depends which house was built first. So the first house will have number one and the second house number two, but the second house might be all the way on the other side of the street. So Tokyo street ad addresses are quite confusing. So this is another police box. Here is a poster of uh, Japan's most wanted. So these police boxes are actually quite convenient. You can go there to ask for directions and uh, uh, we need to push the button here. It says, uh, Omach kudasai. So please wait. So this one we actually have to push. Okay. So I think I'm going to take a chance here. I know you're not really supposed to, but I'll do it anyway. So a lot of the people that live around uh, Tokyo live in quite small apartments, like I said. It's uh, 
super expensive to live around the Tokyo area. So oftentimes when you live in Tokyo, you have like a tiny, tiny apartment. Some people live on 10 square meters or 20 square meters. Or whole families can live on like a 20 to 30 square meters. Here's another cute ramen restaurant. And uh, what they do is uh, often people will live with a whole family in like a one room apartment and they'll have uh, tatami on the floor. Tatami is like a, a mat made of the straw that's uh, left over when they harvest rice. Ah, oh, this is also interesting maybe. Okay, so I don't know if you can see it, but there's a white lantern at this uh, little restaurant and there's a, a brown bowl next to it. And this brown bowl is actually uh, signifies that uh, they have um, the new rice has been harvested and that they have the fresh rice wine made from the new harvest and that's why they hang that uh, brown bowl and I'm not sure if you can see it so next to it is a yakiniku restaurant yakiniku is actually um, Korean not typically Japanese but uh, it's one of my favorite. It's like a, you have a little barbecue in the table and you just put, you put your meat on the little barbecue and just prepare your own food. So over here, there's a soba restaurant. Soba is actually super healthy. So if you wanna eat something healthy, here's another soba restaurant. It's, as you can see, it's super cheap and really good for you so if you want to eat something healthy and not eat too, too much junk food i can definitely recommend uh, eating soba and uh, it's definitely great value for money uh, let me see i have to get my bearings here for a minute yeah let's walk this way so as you can see by this sign uh, both the cyclists and the pedestrians can go on the uh, can share the same area so as a cyclist like here you're allowed to cycle on the road but if you prefer you can also cycle in the street so it's basically up to you so obviously you have to be careful when you walk the streets in Tokyo because you never know if there's maybe a cyclist coming your way so I was uh, explaining to you about the apartments in Tokyo so what people do is they have the tatami the rice uh, straw mat on the floor and uh, they'll put their futon so a futon is like a mattress out at night and the whole family sleeps next to each other on the futon. So father, mother and children. And uh, in the morning, they'll just put the futons away and then they can just sit there and have lunch or breakfast or whatever. So it's like a multi-purpose room. So it's both used as a bedroom and as a um, uh, living room. 
so here's another one of those small Tokyo streets. The only thing is in Japan, um, people tend to live with their parents until they get married. So obviously you can imagine that uh, if you're a teenager and you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, you might want to spend some time with them outside of the house. And uh, if you all live in the same room, that uh, can be a bit problematic. So there's lots of um, uh, what they call love hotels in Tokyo. And a uh, love hotel, usually they have some kind of special theme. So sometimes they're like uh, built in the shape of a castle or uh, like a boat or they're shaped like a tropical paradise with palm trees everywhere. And uh, you can uh, use one of those love hotels for just one hour or you can spend the whole night. So depending on what you want. Uh, so that's super convenient. So as you can see, lots of empty streets. So lots of young people go there if they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend to spend some time away from their parents. Oftentimes, uh, Japanese people, uh, they're very private. So if they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they generally don't let their friends know. And then you think they're single for all this time. And then suddenly you will get an invitation for a wedding like, Oh my gosh, I didn't even know you had a boyfriend, let alone that you were engaged to be married. So that can be quite a surprise sometimes. So what I love about Tokyo is that there's uh, lots of these uh, more traditional style restaurants. This is a Tonkotsu Ramen restaurant. So Oftentimes they'll have a menu outside so you can see what kind of food they have. So here they have all different kinds of ramen and uh, gyoza. So it's really not that expensive. So it's around uh, six, 700 yen for a bowl of ramen. So you don't really have to have a super large budget if you come to Tokyo and you can still enjoy the Japanese food here. Uh, yeah, I can give you some recommendations on the places to go and the restaurants to go to that are really nice and uh, maybe not so well known. So right now we're walking towards the Skiji area. Run for it. So here's another really nice uh, Yakuniku restaurant. So Yakuniku, uh, Yakuniku is actually originally um, Korean, not Japanese. Oh my gosh, we already spent one hour together. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, I'd love to show you more of Tokyo. So maybe we can uh, do this again sometime and I can show you some other areas. Here's another soba restaurant and uh, they have some uh, samples. This is really amazing how they're made. It looks so real. But this is actually made of plastic. So here's some more the dishes they have. So 
thank you everyone for joining me today uh, I was supposed to go to Ginza but I took a wrong turn so maybe I can show you that another time I hope you enjoyed uh, let me know in the comments uh, what you liked and if there was anything else you would have seen or anything I can improve on and uh, keep your eye out on the Flocchio page and uh, Perhaps we'll do another event uh, in the future, so you can see more of Tokyo. Okay. Thank you all for joining me, and hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.